We are finishing up uh, Judges, and we got a lot of material to cover today to finish the book, so we're going to dive right in. Remember, last week we were in chapter 20, and <clears throat> the Israelites, so if you remember what happened, recap, by this time Israel has become completely Canaanite, completely pagan, and especially the people in the tribe of Benjamin at the city of Gibeah. And they went there, and this was an event that was straight out of Genesis from the Sodom and Gomorrah days. And they acted like the people of Sodom, basically, in their treatment towards the Levite and his concubine, who the Levite shouldn't have had in the first place. Everything about the situation is wrong and godless in all aspects. And that's what the whole narrative is trying to drive home, putting this at the end of Judges, is that this characterizes Israel during the period of the Judges. They went from such heights under Joshua and the conquest of the land to completely assimilating into the pagan culture of the land that they were supposed to drive out because of the very paganism that those people practiced. And now Israel has basically become its own worst enemy. So there was this event, this horrendous event, where this woman was completely abused to the point of death. And then her, uh, the Levite, her concubine, her, her husband, uh, basically used her death as a rallying cry to get revenge on the town that did it, but completely leaving out the fact that he was the one that put her in that situation to begin with. So uh, there's this righteous indignation of all of Israel, and he did an ancient Near East war summons where he dismembered the body of someone or an animal or a sacrifice or a prisoner or something. It was, was what happened in the ancient world to rally the troops, only it was of the victim itself. So not only was she victimized, she was also defiled and not even given a proper burial. It's, it's just horrendous on top of horrendous is what is going on in that story. And so in response then, all of Israel finally rallies the troops together and says, we're going to go attack this city that did this. Okay, well, that's, that's a plus, you know, let judgment fall on this city. And so they tell the Benjaminites the, of the territory where the city's in, hey, turn these people over. The Benjaminites put tribal loyalty ahead of covenant loyalty. They should have turned him over immediately. Actually, the Benjaminites should have enacted justice and put to death the men of the city who did that. But they don't. They actually send out their troops to fight to defend these gang rapists. And so it's just the, the whole situation is awful. So that's where we ended last week with the, the Benjaminite troops and uh, all the armies of Israel in a face-off. And so that was chapter 20, verse... 17, yeah, we ended at 17. Israel, apart from Benjamin, mustered 400,000 swordsmen, all of them fighting, all of them fighting men. Verse 18, the Israelites went up to Bethel and inquired of God. They said, who of us shall go first to fight against the Benjaminites? So now they've decided, all right, well, Benjamin's going to fight, so we're going to fight. It's time for war, and we better get God's blessing real quick. So they've already decided on war. They already decided to fight. So they just kind of go to God as an afterthought like you would do in a pagan society. Like, let me get the God's blessing and let me get some wisdom from our God who will lead us in victory. So God says, uh, Judah should go up first. It's only fitting. That's where the victim came from Judah. Uh, so <clears throat> verse 19, the next morning the Israelites got up and pitched camp near Gibeah. The men of Israel, and Gibeah is the city that they're going to attack. The men of Israel went out to fight the Benjaminites and took up battle positions against them at Gibeah. The Benjaminites came out of Gibeah and cut down 22,000 Israelites, or 22 element, uh, elephs, regiments of Israelites, on the battlefield that day. But the men of Israel encouraged one another and again took up their positions where they had stationed themselves the first day. The Israelites went up and wept before the Lord until evening. They inquired of the Lord... They said, shall we go up again to battle against the Benjaminites, our brothers? So the first time they ask, who will go up first? And God says, Judah. So Judah goes, they get their butts kicked. They just massive defeat. So they rally, okay, okay, let's regroup. Let's do this again. All right, let's go inquire of the Lord. They weep, which is like a sign of, of penance or trying to get the God's attention uh, so that he'll act on your behalf. And then they ask again, Shall we go up and attack again? The Lord answered, Go up against them. Now the Lord first time did not say whether they should fight and didn't say anything about the outcome. Just said, Judah, send Judah first. Now the Lord says, Go up against them. 
doesn't promise them victory, doesn't sanction the outcome, and it's almost like God is giving them the answer that they already wanted because of the thing that they had already decided. Now we see this because what's going to happen is they're going to get beat again. We see God doing this in Israel at other times. When Israel is bent or their leaders are bent on doing something against the will of God, God will allow them to go and rush headlong into their own plans and suffer the consequences of it. He does it to King Ahab. King Ahab is saying, should I go fight this battle? <clears throat> and all of the prophets are like, yeah, you got it. Yeah, God's on your side. And then Ahab says, wait a minute, there's one prophet who never says anything good about me. Let me ask him. So they ask for Micaiah. And Micaiah comes in and, and Ahab says, it's 1 Kings, uh, it's chapter 22 of 1 Kings. And Ahab says, should I go fight? And Micaiah's like, oh yeah, go for it. And King Ahab says, why are you teasing me? Like he knows that he's not, he's like, no, no, tell me for real. And there's this whole story about God saying, no, when, when leaders and people are hell-bent on making decisions, sometimes God will confirm their decision in order for them to be judged. And that doesn't sit well with a lot of people's theology. But you have to keep in mind, this isn't like God doing this to people on a day-to-day -day basis. And it isn't like God doing this to people who faithfully are trying to follow Him. So we don't have to wonder like, oh, maybe God's answering me uh, for me to experience judgment rather than actually giving me guidance. No, God does this in times of Israel's national apostasy. And that's what's going on. They have apostatized. They have reached the depths of their paganism. And so God, in, God has no covenant obligation to deal faithfully with them anymore. That's the key. Is God is under no obligation to, to give them reassurance and to give them guidance when they have completely shunned Him and turned to everything about what He didn't want them to be. And that's a warning for us, I think, in Scripture. Is God, just because somebody gets a word, doesn't necessarily mean it's from God. And even if it's from God, check the person who's getting the Word and their behavior and what they're trying to do and their character. And, and are they walking with the Lord? Are they seeking God? Because Scripture gives us this uncomfortable reality that sometimes God will lead people into their own follies, consequences. <clears throat> because that's His judgment on them. And, but that's long after they've reached the point of no return. And that's what we see happening because they say, shall we go up against them? And the Lord says, go up against them. Verse 24, then the Israelites drew near to Benjamin the second day. This time when the Benjaminites came from, out from Gibeah to oppose them, they cut down another 18 regiments or 18,000 Israelites. All of them armed with swords. So all, Israel's best and brightest have dropped by the thousands twice now against, by, by, at the hands of these Benjaminites. Then the Israelites all the people went up to Bethel and there they sat weeping before the Lord. They fasted that day until evening and presented burnt offerings and fellowship offerings to the Lord. Now they are starting to go back to being the covenant people. Burnt offerings and fellowship offerings are Levitical sacrifices. Before they were just seeking almost like an oracle or, or a reassurance. But now they're actually starting to pull back to the covenant obligations or the covenant um, regulations that they had just been flaunting for the entire book. And the Israelites inquired of the Lord. Verse 27. And then there's a parenthetical note. In those days the ark of the covenant of God was there with Phinehas, son of Eleazar, son of Aaron, ministering before it. So this places this whole event in the time of Aaron's grandson. That means this is the first generation of Israel that has not seen the Exodus events. So this is Phineas' uh, younger contemporaries. That means that this, what's happening chronologically, really takes place near the beginning of the book of Judges. And that's a huge whoa moment because we realize, oh, this has characterized Israel throughout most of this period of the Judges. They asked, shall we go up again to battle with Benjamin, our brother, or not? The Lord responded, go. For tomorrow I will give them into your hands. So now God finally says, okay, now go and I will give you victory tomorrow. The judgment against Israel has almost, it seems, been abated or come to completion. And now God says, okay, I will give you victory. Then Israel set an ambush around Gibeah. They went up against the Benjaminites on the third day and took up positions against Gibeah as they had done before. The Benjaminites came out to meet them and were drawn away from the city. 
They figure we beat these guys twice, so let's go get them. There they are. They're near the city. Let's go out and get them. They began to inflict casualties on the Israelites as before. About 30 of the men fell in the open field and on the roads, the one leading to Bethel and the other to Gibeah. So telling you geographically where this is taking place. While the Benjaminites were saying, we're defeating them as before, the Israelites were saying, let's retreat and draw them away from the city to the roads. All the men of Israel moved from their places and took up positions at Baal Tamar, and the Israelite ambush charged out of his place on the west of Gibeah. Then 10,000 of Israel's finest men made a frontal attack on Gibeah. The fighting was so heavy that the Benjaminites did not realize how near disaster was. The Lord defeated Benjamin before Israel, and on that day the Israelites struck down 25,100 Benjaminites, all armed with swords. Then the Benjaminites saw that they were beaten. So finally Israel strikes down these almost all of Benjamin. Now the men of Israel had given way before Benjamin because they relied on the ambush they had set near Gibeah. The men who had been in ambush made a sudden dash into Gibeah, spread out, and put the whole city to the sword. The men of Israel had arranged with with the ambush that they should send up a great cloud of smoke from the city. And then the men of Israel would turn the battle. So the, it's retelling their plan was lure them out of the city, and then when the, when the other forces in hiding come out, lure them away, feet, defeat them in battle, put the city to the sword with the other groups. So there's just this chaos and pandemonium going on, and the city is being defeated. The Benjaminites had begin to, begun to inflict casualties on the men of Israel, about 30, and they said, We're defeating them as in the first battle. So again, Benjamin thinking they're winning. But when the column of smoke began to rise from the city, the Benjaminites turned and saw the smoke of the whole city going up into the sky. Then the men of Israel turned on them, and the men of Benjamin were terrified because they realized that disaster had come upon them. So they fled before the Israelites in the direction of the desert, but they could not escape the battle. And the men of Israel who came out of the towns cut them down there. They surrounded the Benjaminites, chased them, and easily overran them in the vicinity of Gibeah on the east. 18,000 Benjaminites fell, all of them valiant fighters, or mighty warriors. As they turned and fled towards the desert to the rock of Rimon, the Israelites cut down 5,000 along the roads. They kept pressing after the Benjaminites as far as Gittim and struck down 2,000 more. So the Benjaminites are just getting beat down now, crushed, uh, getting chopped off little by little by little until only a few remain. Verse 46, on that day, 25,000 Benjaminite swordsmen fell, all of them valiant fighters. But 600 turned and fled into the desert to the Rock of Rimmon, where they stayed for four months. So this little 600 out of what was initially 20-something thousand, there's 600 left, and they flee to this system of caves out near Gibeah. And it's called the Rock of Rimmon, which means pomegranate rock. And they flee there and they hide there in the desert for four months. That's all that's left of Benjamin. The men of Israel went back to Benjamin and put all the towns to the sword, including the animals and everything else they found. All the towns they came across, they set on fire. So not only did Israel beat the Benjaminites, but now once again escalating the cycle of violence. Because of the crime against one individual, the Levite's concubine, they decided to attack the whole city to uh, punish the guilty, even though it was only some men of the city. So not only did they do that, but then all of the cities of Benjamin, after they beat the Benjaminites in this protracted battle, then they go through on a rampage and they just wipe out everybody in the tribe of Benjamin. They do to Benjamin what God had initially sent them to do to Canaan. Israel has turned on itself and they are treating fellow Israelites as if they are Canaanites, which is only fitting, in the, ironically, because Israel has basically become Canaan. But it's just this spiraling out of control of violence and retribution and more violence and more retribution and, and, and to the point where now it's just this, uh, this disaster, this national uh, ethnic cleansing almost of the Benjaminites. Just totally, everything is, everything is chaos. Everything is being come undone. And now, verse 20, or chapter 21, we get to the end of the story. Now, finally, Israel kind of stops and realizes, wait, 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 what's happened? Oh, this is not good. We've just pretty much wiped out a whole tribe. Chapter 21, the men of Israel had taken an oath at Mizpah. So where they first gathered to say we're going to attack Benjamin for what they did to the Levite's concubine, the men of Israel had taken an oath at Mizpah, saying, not one of us will give his daughter in marriage to a Benjaminite. So this became a tribal war 
and they made an oath saying, we'll not, not only are we, we're going to wipe them out and we're going to make sure that they never have any future because they will never, none of us will give our uh, daughters to them as wives, which is basically saying they are out, we are cutting them off from Israel. And so they made this oath at Mizpah. And Mizpah, that same name of a different Mizpah, but it's the same name as where Jephthah made his rash vow that was unnecessary. And now Israelites are making a rash vow again unnecessary. None of this was God's direction. None of this was God's plan. This was all Israel against the Benjaminites because of what the Benjaminites had defended when the people of Gibeah had done what they had done. So it's just this whole like downward spiral of evil that we're seeing. And now they finally realize what has come, the aftermath. Verse 2, the people went up to Bethel where they sat before God until evening, raising their voices and weeping bitterly. O Lord, God of Israel, they cried, why has this happened to Israel? Why should one tribe be missing from Israel today? Because you murdered them, morons. Like, because you... What do you mean, why should this happen? They're acting incredulous now. They just went on a rampage of violence and pillaging and destruction, and then they turn to God. Why did this happen? It's the most ridiculous thing, and it's supposed to be ridiculous. This shows the absurdity. This entire situation is absurd. And so they're crying out to God of Israel, why has this happened? Why should one tribe be missing from Israel? Because you wiped them out. That's why. Because this whole thing is just gone off the rails. Verse 4, God doesn't answer. They ask why, they weep, they cry, God doesn't answer. God is silent in this entire chapter. That's a huge point to keep in mind in chapter 21. God is entirely silent throughout this. He takes no participation in any of this at this point. It's almost like he's like, I'm stepping away. You, you've both experienced my judgment. Israel has experienced my judgment by getting beat by the Benjaminites. Benjamin has experienced my judgment by the Israelites nearly wiping them out. Now I'm out of this thing. I'm just going to step back and leave you to your own wallow in your own devices. And that's what he does. Verse 4, early the next day, the people built an altar and presented burnt offerings and fellowship offerings. Then the Israelites asked, who from all the tribes of Israel has failed to assemble before the Lord? For they had taken a solemn oath that anyone who failed to assemble before the Lord at Mizpah should certainly put to death. Certainly be put to death. So another rash vow was taken at Mizpah. Not only are we not going to give our daughters to the Benjaminites, but now, anybody who's not in on this massacre is going to be put to death. Any village that doesn't send their men out to fight with us, anybody who's not with us is against us and they're going to be put to death. They made this vow. Entirely unnecessary vow. Verse 6, the Israelites grieve for their brother, the ben brothers, the Benjaminites, after they wiped them out, by the way. Now they grieve for them. And they say, today one tribe is hacked off from Israel. They said, how can we provide wives for those who are left since we have taken an oath by the Lord not to give them any of our daughters in marriage? Then they asked, which one of the tribes of Israel failed to assemble before the Lord at Mizpah? And they discovered that no one from Jabesh Gilead, which is a town on the Transjordan, had come to the camp for the assembly. For when they counted the people, they found that none of the people from Jabesh Gilead were there. So the people from Jabesh Gilead were like, nope, we're not even part of this. You guys do your thing. We're, sticking, we're staying out of this. So the assembly sent 12, 